No. Well, <laughs> it's... Can I green screen? Will my green shirt? I don't think it will green it's screen not green your shirt away. No. Hmm. <laughs> Hello um... and welcome to Kicking Tires. My name is Jimmy. And I'm Justin. And this week is Detroit Auto Show Week, which means we have, I don't know what Justin is doing, but we have some some concept cars available, namely just from Nissan. It is the first day, I think, of the auto show, so not a lot has been released. So we got some Nissan news. Uh, we got some amazing Singer news. Uh, the Kia, they released the Sportage plug-in hybrid. We're going to talk about that. Alfa Romeo increased their entire vehicle lineup by 50% thanks to one vehicle. And Chevy got some new information of the Blazer. But we'll get to that. I want to talk about the most important vehicle this week, which is a Frontier. So Frontier is, you know, the Nissan's, well, in Canada anyways, the only pickup truck available. In the US, they still make the Titan, but here in Canada, only the Frontier is offered. They make three concepts for the auto show and all of them look amazing. So I'll go in order here. Oh, let's talk. A, let's take a look at the Project 72X first. This yeah. is based off of the completely base model of the, uh, of the new Frontier. So it's the S model 4x4 crew cab. But you know what? Even as a base model, I think this looks cool. Why do you have a mask on? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm just discovering the filter functions on uh, uh, within Zoom. Within Zoom, and I'm there's a, like having a blast. <laughs> there, there, there's a lipstick filter if you want to do that. Oh, nice. Yeah, you should you should add that one on. Yeah. But... So the uh, Project 72X. <laughs> Based on the S trim of the Frontier. So yeah, like you mentioned, the base model. And this is an homage to the Datsun 720, which in its day, late 70s, early 80s, that was a bare bones truck. And you still see them on the road because especially if we go to like California, you're going to see like that really old Toyota or Nissan or some Mazdas even, uh, those pickup trucks. Ooh, the rotary ones. Really? <laughs> I don't so, know if you still see many of those. Probably, but. Well, you you'll see them, just not just not with the engine that it's supposed not running. to have. <laughs> yeah, and the bare bones, you know, the S trim is kind of nice. It's got the black door handles, like just plastic. Yeah, and it's kind of a nice touch on a work truck, but it's like it's modified, right? So it's it's kind of what people end up doing to these trucks, anyways. Two and a half inch lift, uh, pretty cool graphics, very retro four by four. Love graphic. the graphics. Yeah, it's like the two hockey sticks. Yeah. Uh, and then the sports bull bar. No, what do you call that thing? The the, the It's bar it's called a awesome. sports bar. It's like the one that goes above the the, bed. the truck bed on the back, but it serves basically no practical use other than Well, you can stand on the back and hold on to something while your buddies jump this don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it also comes with steel wheels. I thought the steel wheels, white painted steel wheels look look really cool. I think that's probably one of the coolest part of this truck. Uh, it yeah. just makes it stand out compared to, you know, everything that you see on the road these days. I, yeah. I like that a it's lot. It's good because it's good because it's cheap. Like it's yeah. anyone could do this. And I think it, it <clears throat> highlights just like one of the looks that you can do with this truck that still looks cool on the cheap uh, yeah. The graphics are simple. The tires are just hand cooked AT twos. Looks like um, so not too crazy of a tire. I think they actually they use the AT two on their regular on the Pro Four X. The Pro Four X, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, but handsome truck. Yeah, yeah. I I think that's nice. But I think this one's my favorite. And moving on for... to the nineties. <laughs> Moving on to the 90s a little bit. I think this one's my favorite. And judging from your Zoom background, I think it's your favorite as well. Yeah. This is based off the hard body. So hard body was like the 90s Nissan pickup that everyone knows and loved. There's a few things about it that, you know, just made it stand out. But here's what the uh, the concept has. So it's the crew cap SV model. So it's like middle trim 
So uh, it's based on the D21 hard body, as I mentioned. It has the 80 style graphics or 90 style graphics that's on it. There's a three inch lift with the Pro 4X uh, fender flare. So it looks a little different than the regular SV. We get 33 inch tires, but the best part about this is the wheels. Yep. The, the wheels hark back to that hard body, that Pathfinder look, and they look absolutely amazing. I love that wheel design. It's yeah. just this chunky block. Yeah, it's like a three spoke wheel, basically. Uh, three spokes, kind of like, well, obviously the Pathfinder, but it's in a bigger diameter now and six lug. I don't know if the old ones are six lug. The hard body, unfortunately, does not have that wrap around side window that <laughs> that the that the weird Nissan trucks had back in the day. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I I absolutely love this. Um, the front bumper making that gloss black actually looks really good as well. Yeah, it's just more cool stuff you can do with your Frontier. I think the Frontier is is such an honest truck like it's there's nothing to it there's no gimmicks and there's no stupid dealer politics where you're you're, <laughs> you're paying more for a new or use one than you can with a new one but it's like we're dangling that three month four month wait in front of you like like it really matters <laughs> I actually have a Frontier review coming up next week, I believe. And I actually did mention that in my review because, you know, if you want, uh, you know, a proper truck, you can buy this. At a non-inflated price. At a non-inflated price. Like even at the MSRP, it's, I think it was like 12 grand less than a TRD Pro. Like oh, I if you know, compare Pro 4X, yeah. Yeah, so like I knew the TRD Pro is a little bit more in terms of like, you know, capability and whatnot, but still, 12 grand is a lot. You know, if you spend 12 grand on your Pro 4X, you can get wheels, tires, suspension. You can probably get a carrier on the back. You can probably get a a, a tent on the back, you know, all for, the, all for 12 grand. And you have a much more enjoyable experience, I would say, the engine buying... is so much better. <laughs> yeah, and the well, engine... spoiler alert, spoiler alert. The Stay engine is the, the engine is good too. A nine speed rather than a six speed in the Tacoma. Come on, like with way more power. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. and I think you know, it looks better too. Like I it pers- just looks more like butch. Yeah, it's it, more muscular. And the reason why I like this hard body version is because it's like that 90s look of the Frontier, which I personally like. And, you know, looking at the current Frontier, I see a lot of that built into it. I you know, love just... the tailgate graphic. Yeah, the tailgate With graphics. The Nissan, are... like, cut out. Yeah. Uh, I feel like we, we need more of these heritage, like, retro build trucks. Because the 90s is 30 years ago. <laughs> like, it's <sighs> it's so bizarre to think about that. But... These trucks, this was 30 years ago. Like this, this to me, like, I feel like five years ago, I could just, I, I wouldn't think anything of it. But now 30 years ago, that is like vintage. That is legitimately <laughs> vintage. Because when, okay, so when we went to like primary school, elementary school, and we saw like a, a 60s car roll up, like a, say a Datsun 240Z, that compared to when you and I were in elementary school is younger than this type of generation of hard body right uh you know it's and it, it just blows my mind that 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 was 30 plus years ago because back then those z cars were only what 20 25 years old <laughs> you know they weren't that old but they looked old as heck <laughs> like I think it's also as you get older, time also slows down a little yeah, bit. Time has slowed down a lot. <laughs> like, is, we've just seen so much come through over the years, and I don't know. Uh, uh, and then they have the last one, which is called the Project Adventure. This so is this very twenty first century. Yeah, this one's definitely there's there's no heritage <laughs> kind of look to this, uh, but this one is probably the one that you know I can see most people doing with their frontiers, just because like, you know, with the twelve grand that you're saving compared to a TRD Pro at MSRP, 
if you're buying a used one from a dealer lot, you're probably saving like 30 grand. But we'll we'll we'll, we'll get back to that rent, I'm sure, one day. But <laughs> this pro adventure model, you get a five inch lift, 34 inch mud terrains, a full Yakima system. So like the rack, the bed, the um the rack on top of the cab itself. You get everything in here. There's a carbon fiber snorkel. There's an LED light bar. Like, it, it's really, really cool, this one. And this is exactly how I kind of see, you know, most people kind of outfitting their, their frontiers because this is, like the project name suggests, the adventure vehicle, right? Yeah. It's got everything you would really want and need, you know, and 34-inch tires on this small of a truck is pretty impressive. Uh, anything short of a gladiator, it's not going to be easy to put 34s on. Uh, and yeah, it's a nice size. I think if you budget 60K, you could build yourself something like this. And it just, the whole point of these kind of concepts is to just inspire people to, hey, maybe that's what I want. If you make yeah. something cool enough and like, hey, I could, I could do something like that. I could, I could afford to build something like that. And it's kind of, it's kind of cool. And the, the beauty of it is the aftermarket follows as the consumer trends shift towards that truck. Uh, you know, the first year of Gladiator, there wasn't that much. And then now it's kind of taken off. Uh, I think the Ranger, they tried pretty just, hard, but I don't see just, that much. They just don't, they're not picking up, at least in that segment, like as far as like, replacing the Tacoma and even the Colorado ZR2, I do see them around, but they don't go crazy with their builds uh, like the Gladiators, like the Tacomas. And there yeah. just isn't that much support for, for even the Colorado platform, as respected as a ZR2 is. I I see more ZR2s out for like day trips, rock crawling things, rather than mm -hmm. actual like this adventure overlanding. Mm-hmm where the Tacoma really shines in this this segment. Um, and the yeah. Gladiator is definitely trying to, you know, pick up some of that slack as well. But it, it's absolutely cool. Um, you know, in this truck segment, you know, if I was to pick one, it would be the Ridgeline. But um, <laughs> if I... You're putting 34s on a Ridgeline. It's, it's, I don't need to turn where I'm going. Uh, <laughs> But like, you know, it, it's absolutely cool. And I like this adventure one because it has a map of the uh, the entire U.S. on the side. So, you know, even if, if you, you feel get like lost, <laughs> <laughs> just pull look over, it. look at the side of your truck and, uh, you know, try to decipher that hopefully is not in like the wheel arch or where the window area is. You know, you, you might not be able to see too much there, but the, the rest of it is pretty good. I... Like you said, I, I do like these uh these concept cars. It just tells you a little bit about you know what you can do, in with you know brand new trucks that's out. And as much as I like the adventure one, that hard body I want the hard body wheels. Is I those wheels like I I the company I think it's NDA that made them. They they need to actually put those into production they need to actually make those because i'm thinking don't only make them in six lug but also make them in five so i can put that on the current gen pathfinder i think nda is nissan nissan oh, is design it? nissan design america oh okay so i thought it was OEM, some sort of other company oem plus kind of oh, stuff nice but whether i don't know if they'll actually make it so they they probably won't uh but if they like i said Make it a five lug, put it on the current Pathfinder. Would love that in green, because I did the I published a Pathfinder review t last week, I think, two weeks ago. Can't remember. And I said, you know, it really, the marketing material says it's like there, there's a lot of that Pathfinder soul in this new Pathfinder, and you there's styling elements. Other than like the three slots on the upper grill, there's really nothing, but. You put these wheels on it, perfect. Speaking of perfect, Justin's yawning because he's tired. This Long is why I need my not... mask. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about Singer. So Singer, if you don't know, 
California based company. They take Porsches, air cooled ones, old ones, and they make it, well, a whole lot better. They yeah. French in like the the headlights. They style restyle the the incomplete front end bumpers, fenders. Like yes, it looks like a Porsche, but no, it's kind of not because it's so different than a standard one. Yeah, this all is the, the hard points are like the same, but then it's just the fine details that it's and there's it's so much so details. much detail. Yeah, it's so, insane. The this this is a this is Singer's first turbocharged 911 that they have kind of reimagined because the all the older ones that they have done is just regular air cooled and they basically all of them have ITBs beautiful system on it but this I, I when this was released I think yesterday I I my eyes oh I I was staring at this because. There's so much little bits and pieces on it that you just don't pick up normally. But like, it's so beautiful. Yeah, I, and I mean, air cooled nine elevens like obviously they're desirable, right? Like the the sounds they make, just the door closing, the shape, it's iconic. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that seventies, eighties German cars just it's not like today, like. The stuff was not built to like a modern 911 standard. I think anything even before the 991 is, is pretty average build. Um, obviously, things have changed a lot in the last decade. But if you ever get into that generation of, of 911, 930s, uh, you know, anything from like, what, 73 up to like 90 seven all the air cooled ones and it, it's just not that impressive like the the build uh and even the engineering behind it frankly is not that impressive uh it is kind of one of these overhyped vehicles but everyone wants one dude these these used to be like the the, the naturally aspirated 911s like an 85 911 you could have those all day long for like 20 30 grand back when... yeah i remember seeing that yeah it wasn't that long ago not 30 years ago like it wasn't really wasn't that long ago you know that you could have one for less than six figures like way less than six figures um i actually really wanted a 912 there no one wants a 912. I, it, exactly. No one wants a 912. That's why I want one because it was cheaper. They're but, still relatively cheap. <laughs> they they still are. But there's a lot of people picking up 912s to do EV conversions. So they're oh. not as cheap anymore. There's a lot of people picking up 912s for EV conversions simply because it looks like a 911. And it's well half the price of one yeah well the the, the turbo <laughs> study the singer turbo study that they just released this is my favorite generation of air cooled 911 because i like the chunky bumpers before the 964 964 i think that the the chunky bumpers were a little bit too much uh and the 912s that generation 911 uh i think it looks too much like a beetle <laughs> but <laughs> This is my favorite generation because I it's thought just... I thought your favorite gen would be the nine nine three. Eh, nine nine three is everyone's favorite. Like nine nine three is the, the is last. the the love child. Like everyone's you know last hurrah. That was it's probably the most desirable generation. Um, but to be like, if I'm getting classic, I want full set on classic. Right, nine nine three is too modern. So the 930 is the first turbo 911 that they had, right? Um, so this has a 3.8 liter flat six. They have electric, electronic wastegates, a water to air intercooler, makes 450 horsepower in standard configuration. Um, you also get touring suspension because the 911 turbo was always designed as a GT car, not some you know hardcore sports car. So it comes with touring suspension. You can opt for sport suspension as an option if you like. The interior, everything is leather. There's wood, there's air conditioning, there's traction control, there's ABS. It comes in at under 2,800 pounds. And 
on the back, those fat tires, you're looking at 295s, 18 inch all around, but 295s in the rear, 245s up front. I, I must say, like, you know, when you're looking at all the details on this, do take a look on, on Singer's website. It's Singer Vehicle Designs or uh, Singer Singer Vehicle Design.com. Check out that engine bay. You know, when are you ever going to see an engine bay as beautiful as this? Leather lined, like the each component, like we talked to a few weeks ago about Koning Seg, about how beautiful their engines and their cars are. This this is something else this engine bay like it's like luggage it doesn't even look like an engine bay like if i got oil on this i would cry like that's (laughs) that's what it looks like it it's such a beautiful vehicle the interior like everything's been updated the gauges the um the electric window switches the vents like everything has been updated the turn signals on the front they're like frenched into the bumper it's such a beautiful vehicle it really is i have to say the seats in this are not my favorite singer seats i prefer that other seat that they had in the in the other 911 that had the uh kind of woven Mm. leather and with the with the brass finishes I don't know what it's called, but the, yeah. the other I, scene I, is more special to me. I, I know exactly which one you are talking about because that one, that look was available at the supercar show in Van Dusen two years nice. ago. Um, well, I, I mean, ultimately it's that. a singer, so you can have it however you want it. So, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I just feel like, oh, okay, this this is a pretty average looking seat for a singer. This interior is not the most impressive singer interior I've seen. But it's still I don't miles think it's, ahead of what uh, I, I, Porsche I don't ever did. think it's designed to be the most impressive interior though. That's the thing. Hmm. Cause the uh, like the this one, the I don't know what they called it. Um there's no name for their car, so it's hard to, to say. Yeah, which it's one. just whatever. I think they, they go by the commission, like whoever commissioned it. Um so it's it's complicated. It's not like RWB where they name it after like a some... video game or like <laughs> or like some manga. <laughs> like... Uh, but yeah, like the the turbo study is absolutely gorgeous. All wheel drive too. Carbon ceramic brakes. It's it's very low key. I love the way they do it too because yeah. you still have that classic wheel, um, the Fuchs wheel. But uh, it's underneath, it's, it's 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 dished out. It's got a, a lot more flair to it. Uh, but on, underneath hides some pretty potent stuff. That vent over the rear, like just in front of that rear fender, it's so beautifully like just put together. Yeah, and it's integrated in that graphic. Like you have to have the graphic. Yeah, absolutely beautiful machine. Uh, speaking of beautiful, I'm actually going to skip one. And move to Alfa Romeo because that makes a better segue, I think. Because <laughs> Alfa Romeo is also, you know, always about beautiful vehicles, and they launched this to- Tonali, I think is pronounced. Yeah, everyone, I'm, I'm... everyone in North America has been called the Tonal, or Tonal, but it's probably like Tonale. Yeah, because like, I'm just thinking, you know, it's Italian. It should be, you know, it's phonetic. Say, you gotta, you gotta pronounce <laughs> every syllable. You gotta get some gusto in there. It's a tonali, you know. <laughs> you gotta Horrible. add the hand movements. <laughs> yeah. you, need, you need the emoji with the with the hand next to it. I it's think the this, Alfa is, Romeo tonale. this is just someone <laughs> pretending to be Italian that's more New York than Italian, like <laughs> Hey, was the gabagoo. <laughs> the, yeah, the g- <laughs> The Capacu. <laughs> so let's take a look at this. Uh, this Tonali. Uh, it's the third vehicle in Alfa Romeo's lineup. They have the Stelvio, which is their SUV, and they have the Giulia, which is their car. Um, they used to have the little one, the 4C. Yeah, the 4C. 4C yeah. But that, that got killed off because... Well, let's be honest, who wanted a 4C? But the Tonali is based off a Jeep Compass. So that's 
you know, it, it starts off kind of kind of down there. Uh, the Compass has been out for a while, so it's definitely not a new platform. But Stellantis also don't have a lot of money, so you know, they're they're just producing something that they can, I think. Uh, but it's bigger than the BMW X1, but still quite a bit smaller than the X3. I think three inches shorter overall than the X3. Mm. Um, so like this is quite a small vehicle, but there are two powertrain options. The first is the plug-in hybrid. It's called a Q4 all-wheel drive. There's a six-speed automatic, a 15.5 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery with a 90 kilowatt electric motor, 1.3 liter turbo four that makes 272 horsepower. 30 miles of electrical range, about 48 kilometers or so. Pretty respectable for, you know, a plug-in hybrid. Um, At 272 horsepower, I think that's more than the X1 would have. Yes, definitely. I think the X2, you can get the 35, which would have more power. I can't remember at this time. Because the X1, I know you can't get the 35 on it. So it I doesn't think have that. this competes a little bit above that class. Like, but the price point is actually supposedly pretty low. It's I'm seeing high, high 30s, low 40s is where these will start at, mm. which is even below the NX, which doesn't start that high. So uh, you're right in that it is X1 price, but uh, I think they're going after the NX. Uh, the NX segment, the X1, BMW. I mean, they've 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 cornered their market. I feel like, uh, <clears throat> and and making the hybrid hybrid option. I think that is directly trying to compete with the with the NX. Mm, so they sense. are undercutting the NX in terms of price. Uh, I wouldn't bet against them <laughs> as far as reliability goes. I don't think. <laughs> I, I don't think I would uh, bet against Lexus there, but it so, is what it is. <laughs> okay, so before I go on to the reliability part, I just want to mention they do have another powertrain option. The standard Q4 all-wheel drive, that's a 2-liter turbo 4 making 256 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque. So that 2-liter turbo 4 should be the same 2-liter turbo 4 that we sound in most Stellantis products. But I don't recall 1.3 in their products oh that's definitely a european engine like yeah right <laughs> yeah because like the the um because the 1.3 turbo is like pretty common size in was the fiat in europe 500 a barf a 1.3 would it be similarly kind of related to that 1.4 i believe mm. yeah yeah it was a 1.4 multi-air yeah, I don't. Yeah, so, I don't think it's an engine that we got on here, at least in any of our products. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a quick bit about the looks here. So when I first saw it, I didn't know the sides. I just saw the photo, and I saw it from the side angle. And to me, I just thought they took a the Stelvio, and then they're like, "Here's a another SUV that's the exact same thing." It wasn't until I read about the actual size that I, it's actually smaller than that. I didn't know. Because the side profile looks exactly like the Stelvio. It's like very the windows. chunky. I think the proportions, I'm not a huge fan of the proportions, especially when you view it from the side. Um, I think it just, it looks clumsy compared to other alphas. Like the nose yeah. is a little bit low. Well, uh, it seems like there's a huge front overhang. Yeah, and this is typically the case when you take an existing platform and slap a different style different shell over it mm -hmm. is that you're, you're probably constrained to a Jeep Compass's hard points and thus it it comes out looking a little bit weird when you just force alpha stuff onto it. Um, definitely there, not that pretty. Not the prettiest alpha we've seen. Definitely not the prettiest overall, but there are some pretty bits. Headlights, taillights, beautiful. Full length taillight bar across the trunk beautiful i do like that sucker for that interior the grill is pretty cool and the grill's always been good for alfa romeos i don't think they ever made a bad grill um interior looks pretty good too i see the huge aluminum paddles behind the, the steering wheel 
<laughs> you know, to control that nine speed auto. That's kind of cool. You get the, I think it was a 10 point something, 10.25. So 10, 10 and a quarter, quarter inch infotainment screen. And you get a 12.3 inch cluster as well. So digital cluster there. Like, you know, there's definitely good parts about this interior. The seats look like Fiat 500L seats to me. I don't yeah, know they're why. very flat. Uh, there's no shoulder to the seat. Yeah. There's not much contouring. It's just like two fat bolsters and then one very flat the, looking seat. Well, the bolsters look like they're tacked on too. So like, it's really weird in terms of its like shape. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think the price is going to make or break this car. Uh, it has potential. Like we do need other alternatives in this class that have the plug-in hybrid. Um, yeah. And it, it it's it's better looking than some of its competitors for sure. Yeah. I don't, I just don't know who is backing the Alpha brand though. Like what dealer what dealer in 2023 still wants to push this brand because you've just been like dragged through the coals over the well, last I'm just, I'm just thinking where you can get an Alfa Romeo these days in Vancouver. It's it's just like well, Chrysler dealerships. Like I'm sure they all have can all do it but it's like is this really the the product that i want to stock and and i don't think it's going to be a stock thing i think it's going to be an order thing which will you know then no one will ever buy it <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, so, yeah it's definitely going to be a problem but you know for i don't want to say it's a higher end vehicle but for high end vehicles it's pretty common that you have to order them anyways considering like the amount of options that it has. But I just think like for for Chrysler to stock them, it's going to be quite difficult. Oh no, there's that Alpha dealership still on Terminal. Main Street, yeah. yeah. They're still there. They have there. no cars inside, but I don't know if it's actually ever open. The lights are always <laughs> off. <laughs> I, I remember the there was a Alpha dealer. I think it was in North Van, but that one got closed off as well. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, now for a mail. Tonali, if you're uh if you're interested, small little SUV, plug in hybrid as an option, or just a standard two liter turbo four. I think I think you know, comparing to the NX, like you said, it's gonna be a good comparison there. I just don't think it's as big as the NX, because the Stelvio yeah. is about there. Yeah, a compass is a little bit smaller. Oh, yeah. well it would be a good competitor size wise to our next vehicle yes the next vehicle great segue the kia sportage unlike the sportage that has the australian guy yelling Aye! in oh, if if you're old enough to remember that commercial uh drop a like if you are but the, the sportage plug-in hybrid um so sportage is kia's version of hyundai's Tucson. They're basically, you know, cousins. They don't look anywhere the same. They're not like Yukon and Tahoe. Tahoe. I couldn't remember the names of <laughs> they're not Yukon and Tahoe cousins where they basically are the same. Uh this is the same underneath, but completely different clothing on it. And yeah. interior is completely different as well, which I do like. Uh, Sportage, Kia's always been like a little bit more sporty compared to the Tucson, and you'll see that in their styling. But the engine powertrain is exactly the same as the Tucson. So it's a 1.6 turbocharged, four-cylinder, six-speed automatic. Paired with the uh, electrical motor, it makes 261 horsepower, I believe. Um, and has 32 miles of electrical range, about 51 kilometers. It's, I think it's going to sell well. The Tucson plug-in hybrid is sold out for 2021. Yeah, but everything is sold out for 2021. <laughs> like, I don't know if True. that's a good measure of like what, what actually sells. Like cars that did not move before are now also sold out or selling for MSRP. Um, yeah. That's true. But like, you know, it looks good. I think, Does you it? know, I, I like <laughs> I like parts of it, you know. There are parts of it that I do like. The back uh, end looks like looks like when when white people mock Asian people and like 
stretch the their eyes out. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Like that's what I see when the tail lights. Uh, it just. <laughs> I think it's an awkward looking car. Okay, the Tucson so is still my choice. The the back end isn't as good. Uh, I will admit, the front end to, is not good either. <laughs> I, I'm okay with the front. I'm I'm happier in the front than I am in the back. But you know which part I like about this Kia more than the Hyundai, the interior. The interior is nice. Um, so Hyundai's interior is not bad in any way, but. Hyundai's interior, there's a little screen for the dash, and then you have the kind of slab in the middle for the infotainment. It's kind of bad. Else. It's literally like a cube, like a gloss black fingerprinty cube. And there's yeah. not that much styling to the interior of the Tucson compared to this. Yeah, this this definitely looks better on the inside. Um, dedicated buttons for climate control, if mm -hmm. that matters to you. And I like the center console as well. It, it just looks more functional there. Um, it's very still hope... premium, and and that's the thing is like, how is an Alfa Romeo going to compete when this is the same size, same range? Yeah, obviously doesn't have the brand, but I mean, how is but an Alfa Can really a flex? But in Canada, is Alfa a brand? Exactly, like, it doesn't have that that panache to it. I um, I feel like if I go out and say I I'm driving an Alfa Romeo, if to a car to a car person, they'll be like, oh. Do you have the quadrifolio? But yeah. to anyone else, they'll be like, never heard of that. W what is that? Yeah, like, a little bit better than a Kia. At least you can say it with your hands, <laughs> like yeah, with yeah. your fingers crossed. <laughs> you can do the full New York. Alfa Romeo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I must admit, you know, it is definitely better than a Kia. But, you know, the, the money that you'll be saving here. Yeah, it's going to be a hard pick for me to take the alpha over something like this or Tucson or <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> anything below it. Cause I think luxury is so what, what, what qualifies as luxury these days is or any time and any time in history, a luxury car, it's kind of a joke. Like any luxury car, like you go, you go 15 years newer and the, the base model compact, you know, uh, commuter cars are better. They just have yeah. more creature comforts. They're probably even quieter than than what was considered quiet 15, 20 years ago. And yeah. so to me, the the line of luxury is very arbitrary. Like people just, it's pretty much just the brand. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I would agree. Because like, if you look at, a, you know, a 90s Mercedes S-Class, what did you get in that? You know, you got leather seats, power windows, power sunroof, double pane glass, double pane glass, which for most cars you still don't get. Uh, but you get an AM, FM cassette, and CD player. Like, yeah. you know, those are the things. It was a bunch of features and cushy soft seats, but like, you know, and heated seats. Yeah. But like you said, you know, commuter car, like a Hyundai Accent, Kia Real. In Canada, one step up, one trim up already gets you heated steering wheel and heated seats. Yeah, keyless access. Like to me, I'd be <laughs> a lot more comfortable commuting in that than than a 20, 30 year old S class. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. probably also have a lot less problems. Uh, yeah. no, you're you're absolutely right. You know, the, the luxury kind of it, it continues to move, right? That technology always changes. Yeah. But you but, know what? Speaking of luxury, that okay. So there's Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis. We talked about this many times in the past. Mm -hmm. To me, this interior is is up there. Uh, in terms of looks, Hyundai stand, where, in terms I know of you, looks anyways. I know, I know what you're gonna say. You say it. <laughs> no, I'm just, just saying say in it. terms of looks, because I like, I, I don't you... think this is gonna be any worse built than than a Hyundai though. I'm not saying it's gonna be worse built. Uh, I'm just saying, like, the interiors of Hyundais and Kias always look great in photos. Yeah. But when you get inside it, it just doesn't meet the same experience that you see in the photos. And it's consistent throughout, basically, most Hyundai and Kia products. Mm. They look really, really good. Like, when I was looking at Until the Ionics... Until you start using them and then covering them in fingerprints and, and dirt and The, the fingerprints, I'm okay with because, like, I do have a microfiber always in a car and I clean the car consistently. I don't have a problem with that. But, like, it's 
for example, I was in the Ionic 5. Photos Ionic 5, beautiful, spacious cabin. You get inside and, you know, things start to feel a little bit, though I don't want to say cheap, but just kind of lower rent. Like all the plastics, they, they creak a little bit more like than they should. It just doesn't feel like, you know, you're going to hate me for saying this, but like a Mazda plastic, you know what I mean? Like, or a, a German BMW plastic. It's different the way that it creaks. That's yeah. the problem I have with Hyundai and Kias. Yeah. And even working <clears throat> on them, um, they tend to not go back together as well as a BMW or a Mazda or even a Toyota in that sense that, Actually, that's a good point too, right? People will get lured in. They think, okay, well, looking at the picture of this, like, damn, that is a nicer interior than any Toyota. But <laughs> realistically, I mean, a Toyota, you can take it apart, put it back together, and it will be the same. Uh, Hyundai, you will have broken clips everywhere, and it will squeak and rattle, and that is just the norm. <laughs> it's just how how they're built. Uh, that's why it's fit and finish but i don't know why everyone decides to clump it onto one category because to just the finish fit, <laughs> the fit is always good in toyotas at least yeah. with the interior <clears throat> well um, you you sent me a photo of a highlander not that long ago and the fit was pretty garbage well the exterior that. panel fit is not that good <laughs> yeah. that's the highlander the sienna uh what else is terrible lately even the Odysseys, the Hondas are really bad nowadays. Like the panel gaps are inconsistent. Hmm. Uh, yeah, but they don't rattle. They don't. Yeah, it's it's fine. Like no one, no one buying that car cares, anyways. <laughs> I, like I said, you know, I, I I do like a lot of Hyundai and Kias on paper, in photos. They all look great, but are we like... ready to merge them back as like? And though i i think they're distinctive enough to say that you know if you buy a kia it's a knockoff audi when you buy a hyundai it's or hyundai i should say it's something i don't know what else it could be but kia is kia is knockoff audi right because okay if we have one <laughs> brand between the two if we consolidate them that's one R&D, that's one dealer network, that's one parts network, that's one marketing department. You, you keep wanting and to put them together. They're, they're, they're not going to do that. I know. I don't. I feel like I feel like had we told them 25 years ago, we don't need two brands that compete in the exact same segments to confuse everyone because it's it's hard to say which one is better because they it, there's so much back and forth as far as like which one's nicer, which yeah. one's sportier. I don't think there is really like because look at Hyundai's Kia is supposed to be a sporty brand, but Hyundai's taking all the end stuff and doing all the fun stuff over there that yeah. Kia doesn't really have anymore. Uh, they kind of tried a little bit with their GT, Stinger, stuff like that, but Hyundai is the one that's really making moves as far as the sport compact segment uh, or any sport you know, commuter yeah. vehicle. Well, they have three um, full on end cars. Yeah. And then some people were like, well, the Hyundai is supposed to be a little bit more on the luxury side. Not really. Cause again, there's that's just back and forth. And I think it's, it's confusing. And if we could combine our R and D efforts to make one interior, one exterior and one set of engines, how much further would this brand be <laughs> at this point? Because it just, to me, it's like they they cut corners somewhere, and obviously, we know in the last ten years their engines have not been great. Uh, electronics have not been great. I get an endless stream; like it keeps my business afloat because their <laughs> radios always die. Any any Hyundai, Kia, like in the last ten years, Blue Link, anything with an amp, they always fry. Uh, all the Infinity sound systems, they're all garbage. Um, and more so than any other brand I've seen is are the Hyundai and Kias, hmm. uh, as far as like electrical issues, burnt out bulbs, yeah, amps, radios, all that stuff, backup cameras not working. It's ju it's just I don't know. To me, it's it's not necessary to have two separate brands 
doing the same thing when everyone else only has one. And if you could combine that effort, maybe you could just make one killer vehicle. I know they won't combine. So they won't. <laughs> I'm not going to suggest that. What I want them to do is the interior team to swap. Okay. Huh. That that's all that's all I want. Cuz Kia's interiors to me anyways has always been better than Hyundai's interiors. I like Kia's interiors more mm -hmm. than Hyundai's, but I like Hyundai's exteriors more. Roughly. You know, if we Generally, look at yeah. The like if I look at the Santa Fe versus the uh the Sorrento's Sorrento. interior is not that great. Uh, but the exterior of the Santa Fe, I like more than the Sorrento. Hmm. Uh, this versus the Tucson. I like the Tucson. I love that front end with the multi daytime running lights. I think it's very distinctive and that's super cool. It's not going to age well, but I think it's still super cool. But the interior in that, like, it's fine for, you know, a brand new car. But I like this one more. I like the look of this one more. Same thing with like the, the EV6 and the Ionic 5. I really like the exterior of the Ionic 5, but the EV6 interior, that's better to me. Yeah. So definitely swap out that team. And then, you know, you'll have one brand that I would never look at again. And then one brand that I would buy. <laughs> and then it would just die off. So we, we get to the same result, different <laughs> steps, but the same result because you just have. You know, you have, I, I guess this must be a strategy, right? Is that we're going to try to cannibalize the market. Like, we're going to keep you shopping in this segment. If you want a compact crossover, you're either going to be looking at our car A or car B from Kia or Hyundai and just hope that you don't look at the competitors. Yeah. Well, they make they make a strong argument not to look at their competitors too, right? They do, and their sales are are not bad for both brands. That's no. a good thing. Is, um, I mean, in in this segment, like Sportage, Tucson, what other plug-in hybrid is there? Just the Rav4, and of course, the Outlander is going to be coming out soon as well. So there's only that four. Those are bigger and more expensive, though. I think. Well, the Rav4 is the same size as this, uh, but the Rav4 is more expensive. Yeah, and the Rav4 because of everything that's going on, you can't get one for two years. You can get a Tucson. My aunt actually just got a Tucson. She lives down in the states. She got a Tucson. It got shipped from New York to Seattle for her, and she got a Tucson plug-in hybrid. Nice. They want that sale. <laughs> They're they desperate did. for that. They, they were very <laughs> desperate for that sale, um, but. They went into Whereas Toyota. <laughs> if you ask Westminster Toyota, I <laughs> think you would rather have have one Rav4 Prime than two of these because they're asking 80k for the Rav4 Prime. No, it's not Westminster. <laughs> it's uh, oh, I forgot what. It's the Steel Creek location. Eighty three thousand is the destination. Eighty three thousand dollars for a Rav4 Prime. I, I was looking through the blurb. The yeah, the, yeah they charge luxury tax on a Rav4 like. Who would have thought in the day and age that we are in now that you get charged luxury tasks? On and who would who would in their right mind take one of those over? I could have both a a, <laughs> a Tucson plug-in and a Rav4 hybrid normal one. Yeah, a price of one Rav4 probably less because of the luxury tax, and yeah. they would have full warranty on them. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, used car prices are uh, are quite insane. But no, cool. I don't think used car prices are. I think dealers are on crack. <laughs> dealers, dealers because are on crack. You're absolutely not, right. Because people aren't. But again, we're checking in every week. That 83k car it's is still, still there. there. <laughs> it's very much still there. Um, speaking of dealers that are on crack, but Chevy's dealers aren't because. Uh, you know, if you go into a Chevy dealership now and you say you want a car, they're not going to charge you, you know, $20,000 more because... Unless it's a C8. Yeah, well... <laughs> Fair that's, enough. That's Fair slight, enough. That's that slightly car was different. underpriced, way underpriced to begin with. <laughs> yeah, just a tad, right? 
Uh, so for 2023, Chevy has updated the Blazer. So the Blazer is their brand's midsize SUV, two row midsize SUV, slotting under the Traverse, but above the Equinox. And it's the first update since 2019. So you get new uh, LED headlights, LED daytime running lights, new LED taillights. The rear bumper is basically the same from what I can see, but the front grill looks a little bit different. Uh, the interior has also been updated a little bit. You get a bigger infotainment screen. The Blazer is the Camaro of SUVs, right? That's there what they are, want us to think. They, <laughs> that's what the marketing says. There's Camaro bits and pieces and styling bits and pieces. I never had a problem with how the Blazer looks. I'll be honest. When I drove it back in 2019, I was like, you know what? It's not a bad car. The one that I had had that 3.6 liter V6. So it had more power. I think it was like 300 and something horsepower. Um, 308? Yeah. 308 horsepower. And it was fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's pretty good looking. It's I'll be honest. Like, uh, but really the problem good. is we only see the RS models. Yeah. <laughs> but the RS model is really good looking. But the RS one is the one that you want. <laughs> Let's I be don't honest. Have- 50k to blow on a mid That's the thing that will depreciate. So the the biggest problem with the the Blazer isn't so much, you know, the car itself. It's it's a, it's a fine vehicle. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just the price. You know, at like you said 50 grand, it's a lot of money to be paying for a Chevy Blazer that's going to depreciate half in 2 years. Yeah. And then everyone everyone who like is a noob with buying cars. They're like, no, use car. You don't lose money on cars. Like, cars hold their value so well. Like, no, no, a Blazer is not going to hold its value well. Yeah, you're, if you're basing it on like twenty, like a twenty twenty Blazer in twenty twenty one, sure, it may be barely depreciated, but we're talking about four years down the road. Yeah, you no, know, it's it's going to be a different story for this car. I, I, I really don't have any problems with this. Um, when I did the review back in 2019 and I compared it to a Murano, um, the MSRP was higher than a Murano, but the actual dealer pricing. So, cause I picked it up from a dealer. I checked out their lot. They had a brand new RS, the same as my tester. And it was like almost $10,000 off that you nice. can buy. F- that's the sticker. On there, it says MSRP is whatever it was, but they slashed it, and you can buy for ten grand off brand new for car. For ten grand off, this is definitely worth buying. I yeah. think it's it's worth considering at least. But that was in twenty nineteen. I don't think you can get that anymore. Uh... Maybe at a Chevy dealer. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how desperate they are to get it. But... Yeah, I. What does like it said, even compete with though? Like Passport, Murano, Passport uh, Ford Edge. Port Edge, madame. Like it's 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 not a good segment. A two row mid size SUV isn't a segment that people want because you spend yeah. a little bit more. You get three, three rows. rows. You, you get the Traverse. You get a much bigger vehicle. Uh, but if you're you know dead set on Chevy, a Blazer looks so much better than a Traverse. The Traverse. <laughs> the Traverse is a dorky looking. Yeah, the, really the, dorky looking car. If you're Here's here's a kicking tires tip. If you're in the market for a Traverse, spend ten thousand dollars more, buy a Buick Enclave. The Ooh. Buick is the most beautiful SUV you can get. And then it's, because they don't sell any Buicks, get the dealer to knock a few grand off. They they can probably knock off ten grand for you, which means you're getting it for the same price as a Traverse, anyways. There's that a, is a good... kicking. Kicking tires top tip for you. That is a good tip because yeah, the Buicks are very beautiful. Yeah, I I got one booked later this year. Can't the wait. The full size, the Enclave. The Enclave. I'm so so excited because I I still think that's the one of the most beautiful three rows SUV. You and can everyone get. in Canada is sleeping on this brand, or at least locally, is sleeping oh, on Buick. You, as you a don't brand. see a Buick at all. Um, they're they're huge in China. If you you know, just yeah, even on their front everywhere. page right now, it's it's talking about the Chinese New Year. Like that is that yeah. is the market they're going for. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know why it's but a huge the Chinese. Market there. The Chinese. They. I guess they're onto something because. Yeah. You know what? They, but they buy it there, but not here. They buy it there, but not here because our imports are too cheap. Mm. Our imports are, relatively speaking, very affordable to get into compared to in Asia. And that's kind of always been the case. Like luxury cars are just too, too affordable. They, they'll go down a segment just to have the brand to say, hey, I can get, because there's no way in Asia you can get an X1, like a BMW SUV for, still technically qualifies as a BMW SUV for under 50. Right. Yeah. True, true. And that's really all I got for this week. Anything else you want to go over? I think we are on schedule <laughs> for yeah. once. For, no, for once. no endless rant. Um, no, not this Our driver means. didn't get back to us. We didn't get sued. <laughs> uh, Yet. What else? Yet. <laughs> but honestly, that was one of the... Like, that was a pretty embarrassing show for for car and driver like yeah if you haven't watched last week's episode go back and we're we're, we're breaking down their their editor's choice list and just to see how big of a sellout uh some journalists are yeah definitely yeah definitely oh definitely. do you want to talk about your channel this week? uh what did i release this week i oh <laughs> my favorite suv of 2021 the Alpina XB7. Living in excess. Um, you know, because everyone can afford a $200,000 uh, SUV. Cause, you know, you know, my gripe about Nissan, or not Nissan, why did I say Nissan? About Alpina is Nissan, okay, so when we saw that Frontier hard body concept, it's cool that they brought back that wheel. But Alpina, you're beating a dead horse with this wheel. Like, I need to see a new wheel. Uh, can you not see? That's not the same wheel. This is it's, the wheel that they use in the wheel, Z8. But same, same design. They used same. this wheel in the Z8. All right. It I had was... a customer come in with one on a six series, and that was such a heavy wheel. Like, I want to see the side by side because it, the normal BMW wheels are not that heavy. Right. But this wheel was shockingly heavy uh off of a it was off either a seven series or a six series like early 2010s and oh, i was the like, the multi-spoke yeah, yeah it looks, looks kind of like this <laughs> it looks kind of like this and uh super heavy wheel and i'm just like i'm bored of this design all right I wanna see something new the xb7 best suv that i've driven in 2020 checks every box like it's so comfortable but like it's... when you turn it to sport, it actually feels like you're turning to sport. And that's the best thing about the Alpina XB7. So when I drove the X5M, I was like, you know what? Give a shot, you know, see how it is. I had it around town in comfort and my wife was like, this car's really jiggly. I'm like, yeah, it's an X5M. It's, you know, that's what it is. You know, I it's a vehicle that's supposedly compromised because it's an M car. But the XB7 didn't have that. And I didn't feel like it was that much worse around twisty roads than the X5M was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To like a, a rational human being, uh, how fast you would take an, a 6,000 pound SUV around a corner, I'm sure it's just as good. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. let's be honest. You're, if you have money for an X5M, you're not taking the X5M to the track right yeah it's going to be another like if you have that kind of money you wouldn't be like ah, oh, i want to take my x5m to the track i'm gonna probably take something else to the track what kind of fuel economy did you get that week uh don't measure those things with uh with vehicles of this caliber with 600, <laughs> 600 horsepower, horsepower <laughs> six thousand pounds it was uh it was actually better than the gls i think i averaged like 18 that is Pretty reasonable for six thousand pounds. Yeah, I think it was eighteen. The GLS was about twenty something. That's like a foreigner V six five speed automatic. Oh, foreigner, the foreigner that I had like two years ago, I think it was. It was horrible. Um, I was averaging like twenty. The the foreigner, yeah. it's it's horrible. One this makes triple the power and it seats 
<laughs> quadruple the amount of people. Well, and... one more than a foreigner. <laughs> I mean, I would it's... rather sit in the egg seven. Oh, why? <laughs> really? <laughs> it it honestly was probably one of the. I should say it fits four times more people in comfort than a foreigner. <laughs> true, 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 true. It's you know what, like. I I've driven a, a regular X seven forty I, like it, there is a substantial difference between a X seven forty I to this. Not just like in terms of power, obviously, the, almost like double the horsepower, if not double the horsepower, but like just the amount of luxury trimmings that you get inside, the suspension, how that's tuned, how it feels. There is a significant difference on the Alpina XB seven comparing to the X740i. I have to say, I like the size of this SUV. Like, it's, it's not it's three row massive. without being without being too overwhelming. Yeah. Um I wish um, there was a, a bench option for the middle. Because that oh, would you make can't, it not with an Alpina. No, it only has bench seats, which means yeah. if you don't use a third row, it's only a four passenger. Mm. Yeah. Um, which you kind of fit in the third row. It, I, I do fit, but it's definitely not comfortable. Oh, and because kids. the second row has those um, power adjustable seats, you know, you're going to be standing out in the rain for a while before you can jump into the third row, which <laughs> is the same problem that the GLS has. There isn't a manual operated seat. And you can walk through the middle. The kids not, can. Enough, not enough room. It's, it's too tight within the, the seat itself. Hmm. Yeah, fair enough. I think I think for the type of family that wants a three row SUV, typically it's gonna be we have two kids. Occasionally we gotta take grandma and grandpa. And yeah. I think this size of SUV is really nice for that. Yeah. Um no, you're it's, absolutely right. It's not it's, that much of a sacrifice to live with every day. Yeah. If you know, if you say you have three kids, you wouldn't be getting an X seven, you're getting a Tahoe. Mm -hmm. Like or, or a Sakoya. Tahoe XL. Maybe, well, next next year. Next year you will not not <laughs> not in the last, not over the last twenty five years, but <laughs> no. but next year we might. Ne yeah. Next year you you might consider it then, yeah. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I I realize I may not be able to take the Sequoia. Just I I taking some measurements and I'm like, I don't really have room for it. And oh. that is, I Might wish I had grudge. something X7 size. That's why, I'm, that's why I mentioned that like this X7 is like a nice size because the my so it's it's kind of it won't fit in my driveway or it won't fit in my garage. But uh, the Sequoia was meant to be in my driveway, but because my the Strata rule is that all four wheels have to be on the driveway, not on the, the road way or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's Don't have why. Enough. If it if it oh. overhangs, it's okay, but all four wheels have to be on the driveway, which I think is going to be a struggle. Yeah, you. What if you like backed it up all the way, like the rear bumper touching your garage door kind of thing? I think I'd have to open the garage door and move it in like six. Just inches. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, the garage door. Yeah, maybe I cave in the garage with it. Oh, that's fine. That's Just make it make an indent in it. <laughs> yeah. If you crash into it, it'll make a perfect indent. It'll be it'll be awesome. Yeah, or just leave the garage door open. Nothing in there to steal. I mean, it's not like you got an M2 in there. Yeah, it's not like they can get that out if the Sequoia's in the way, anyways, right? So exactly. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that's really it for this week. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, listening in and watching on YouTube. But uh, we'll catch you next time for more auto news. Hopefully there's more stuff from Chicago, but we'll see. Mm. See you next week. Take care.